Hello and welcome to TCW TV and the third of our Defending Freedom interviews. Today I'm talking to one of the few economists to have spoken out about the full and disastrous impact of lockdown on the economy, the worst of which is yet to be felt. Rocketing energy prices, petrol queues, haulier shortages, threatened or imminent factory closure are daily news. Britain has had uh, has thrown more money at the problem than almost any other developed economy. 370 billion, that is getting on for 20% of GDP, one-fifth of annual GDP. It, it frankly hasn't worked. Lockdown was a, a very significant uh, error. I think it also has to be remembered that the British economy was the second worst performing economy in, in Europe uh, in 2020. So we've reached a never-never land of I think, delusional public spending. Do we really want to live in a, in a country where um, the state is over half of GDP? I don't think that's compatible with a free society. Ewan Stewart argues much of what we're experiencing is the direct result of poor policy choices by government that flow directly from lockdown, delusional public spending and a very poor bang for the buck. Few are better placed than he to explain the economic mess we're in. A city economist of 30 years experience, the founding director of Wallbrook Economics, a consultancy specialising in fiscal policy that advises major pension funds, asset managers and hedge funds. Ewan Stewart also writes for think tanks like the Institute of Economic Affairs, Global Britain and Centre for Policy Studies. And two years ago, he delivered the Adam Smith Lecture at Pembroke College, Cambridge. What do you make of what's going on at the moment? Well, it isn't normal. This is the most extraordinary period to be involved in the economics profession. I walked down, uh, the, uh, I walked down the road here and it looked busy. The, the restaurants looked quite full. But actually, what we've seen in the last few years is an economic policy. This is 10 or 15 years in the making, exacerbated by the lockdown, which is unprecedented. We've had enormous monetary creation, uh, 890 billion uh, over the last decade. Uh, 450 billion since, uh, since, since the lockdown. We've locked the economy down for 12 months with enormous implications for, for many industries. And we have a state that's grown to 56% of the economy. When I started out as a city economist 20 or 30 years ago, people did not really talk about government. We, we looked at the actions of the Bank of England, the budget, and whether a pint of beer was going up and the budget was discussed. But actually, uh, the economy was more about uh, technology, it was more about uh, the development of companies and, uh, and growth. Now all our conversations are, are second-guessing what government will do, what central banks will do, and the size of the state, the size of public spending, and it's not healthy. But if you go back to what's happening at the moment, so really what you're saying, people are living in an illusion. There's an illusion of normality except for we're queuing for petrol. It, it, the, it, it's quite schizophrenic at the moment because on the one hand, for somebody like me, you, you know, who was around in the 70s, this feels like we could be going back to a 70s style um, crisis. And um, I mean, and you think, is this like Russia? These are Russian, like Russian bread queues. What are we doing queuing for petrol? On the other hand, there is a level of normality. I think the crisis really started uh, about 12, 13 years ago with the global financial crisis. Policymakers had a basic choice and they decided to reflate the economy. They decided to crash interest rates. They decided uh, through a program called quantitative easing uh, to, to create money effectively and that refloated uh, the banking industry. There was some normality because uh, um, Government policy, uh, in, particularly in the UK, but also in, in Europe, control public spending to a fashion. Uh, the left describe it as a period of austerity. I don't buy that. Public spending grew every year. But at least there was an attempt uh, to, to try and stimulate uh, the private sector. Then comes along COVID, and it took 10 years, by the way, to even stabilise the public finances after the global financial crisis. And we stabilised the public finances at a situation very much weaker than we went into it. So when we talk about stabilisation, we meant the growth in public spending uh, and public debt was slowing down, but the absolute numbers were much greater. To put this into context, between the Napoleonic Wars 
and 2005, Britain's accumulated debt was 500 billion. Within six years, it went to a trillion. Last year, 11, 15 years after the global financial crisis, we topped two trillion. And uh, my consultancy and, and, and others would, would expect that to go to two and a half trillion uh, by, by 2025 20, or, uh, or more. The question is, what has been achieved with that excess expenditure? I would say remarkably little. So the economy has been leveraged. And it's not a surprise that uh, I would say the economy has been sugared. So if you, if you look at COVID uh, and, and the lockdown policy specifically, on the government's own numbers, 370 billion has been spent. Now to put 370 billion in context, that's enough to feed the entire population with food for two years. These are enormous numbers. What's that money been spent on? It's been spent on, on, on furlough, which is effectively paying people a compensation when you when you you take away their livelihoods for a period it's been sent on bounce back loans much of which was quite questionable and it's been spent an enormous increase in in, in the public sector despite the fact that productivity in that sector has collapsed uh, and i so yes the gdp numbers are rebounding but it is something of an illusion and the underlying productivity of the country is is severely stretched as are its finances. Before we come to what the consequences of this are and how this is going to be mitigated or not mm. and what happens if it's not mitigated, can I just come to you something that's really confused me totally mm. and must confuse a lot of people. We've basically got a contracting economy as far as I can see at the moment. Um, furlough ended at the end of September yet today even 1.1 million job shortages, vacancies, well, uh, it, it does seem par paradoxical, but what we've had is a situation where government has greatly thrown money at the problem. It has is, it is sugared uh, the economy. The economy was locked down for uh, 12 months, 15, a bit longer, 18 months, and there wasn't much people could spend their money on. So you couldn't go away on holiday. The savings ratio, the amount of money people save, has increased very rapidly. So the economy gradually starts to open up. People have saved. Uh, and also, a lot of people have reappraised their lives. You know, so you, we had a situation until very recently where 40% of people on furlough worked in the hospitality industry, but restaurants in London couldn't get staff and were putting wages up mm -hmm. very rapidly. So I, I think what actually has happened in the last 18 months is people have thought, is this what I want to do? Uh, and an awful lot of, of people on furlough anyway are working in fairly short term work and they wouldn't necessarily have stayed in Starbucks, for example, for, for, for 18 months. So furlough comes uh, to uh, an end. Uh, there have been uh, s skill shortages uh, and labour prices are going up really quite rapidly and particularly in the building industry, the hospitality industry uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 lo and logistics. So we've got a situation of embryonic inflation uh, as a result of, of supply shortages. Uh, and this isn't healthy. It isn't healthy. And it is a direct result of government interference. If you take the lorry drivers, for example, you know, one of the reasons there is, is a shortage is that virtually no new uh, uh, workers have come into that industry. There's been no testing of uh, HGG drivers. So people retire and they move on to do other things. It's no great surprise that uh, as a result, there's a shortage. It's not just a UK shortage, it's a European shortage. It's a global shortage, actually. You close an economy down, something that's never been attempted uh, before, when you try to open it up, you're going to get all sorts of what economists call our, our bottlenecks. Lots of people have blamed Brexit for the, for the, for the labour shortages. Um, is, is, this, has, is there any credibility in this or is it a myth? It's a myth. Uh, for example, Britain's not short of people. Six million Europeans have chosen to make their home in, in the UK. Uh, well, uh, since Brexit. Uh, since six, six million Europeans have applied to have settled status in the United Kingdom. Now, if we contrast that number, the Home Office thought there'd be three million. So actually, they, they've wanted to, to make, make their life here. And many of them are very skilled and provide you know, an important contribution to, to our society. Uh, this is not a UK problem. This is a global problem. Uh, and it, it's come a result of, uh, of a lockdown economy where, uh, where people have not been training over the period, so you have people retiring, new people haven't been coming, coming through. Uh, uh, you've had uh, factory disruption, um, supply disruption. This is a, a, a global phenomenon, and I don't think you can, can say it's down to Brexit. 
um, it, it, uh, it, it, is, it is simply down to the, the lockdown. Some of the particular problems we're having here, how much is that due to furlough and creating what um, some people call a work-shy um, population? I think the furlough scheme uh, was, was ultimately misguided. It went on for far too long. There, there was perhaps a moral imperative mm -hmm. initially if you're going to lock down an economy to provide compensation. Mm -hmm. It was a government-inspired lockdown. I think that lockdown was a, a very significant mm -hmm. uh, error. I think it also has to be remembered that the British economy was the second worst performing economy in, in Europe. Uh, in 2020. Only Spain performed worse. And you contrast that actually with countries that took a more liberal approach like Sweden. Actually, Swedish GDP growth is already ahead of where it was prior to the lockdown. That is simply not the case in Britain. Britain has, had, uh, has thrown more money at the problem than almost any other developed economy. 370 billion. That is getting on for 20% of GDP, one-fifth of annual GDP. And uh, it, it frankly hasn't worked. It, it, it has caused people uh, to be unproductive over that period. And I think many have decided to, to reappraise their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's great. People always reappraise mm -hmm. uh, what they're doing and is, is resulting in quite significant shortages but in certain areas. I want to come back to the sort of economic literacy of the government and the responsibility mm -hmm. of the government. But before that, just going back to this concept of reappraising lives, in the press release that was sent me yesterday, embargoed for today, um, with quotes from recruitment agencies about not being, mm -hmm. not enough people to employ, not enough um, employees available, potential employees available, they said people don't want to work like they used to want to work. Now, that may be so. Young people may not want to work. They may want to be family friendly. They may want to do... But if you're running a business or running a restaurant, can you afford this reappraisal? Can the country as a whole afford in this time of economic crisis, this highly individualistic, oh, I only want to work like I want to work. Well, right. I think we should trust the market to an extent that, you know, I think the market will work quite effectively. If, for example, we have a shortage of, uh, of lorry drivers, already there's evidence that salaries in that profession are, are rising. And that will encourage more people to become lorry drivers. The answer isn't, uh, isn't a short-term fix of... Uh, uh, of, the, of government interference or, uh, or, or uh, having a short-term migration policy. That, uh, uh, th those are very, very short-term measures. You're far better letting the market ch uh, set the right salary and people will go into that industry in time. Uh, it's a far more effective allocation than, than, than uh, centralised decision. Can the market still work as a market though? Well, that I think it could if we gave it a chance, but we've reached a situation where the government has become the overwhelming agent and we've moved very, not just in this country in fairness, but in large parts of Europe and, and, the, and the United States, where actually we live in a very highly regulated, large state, uh, uh, government controlled uh, in, environment where uh, every time there's a problem, the answer is what can the minister do to solve that mm. problem? In actual fact, many of the problems I believe flow from micro decision uh, making. So we, if, if you take uh, energy prices, highly topical at the moment, yes the gas price has spiked very significantly. There are many factors behind that, uh, not least um, geopolitics in terms of uh, supply from Russia and the, the politics of, of Nord Stream 2 which may or may not happen. Britain has become highly integrated into the European uh, en energy uh, market but we've also shot ourselves in the foot. We had uh, diversity uh, of, of supply. We have basically shut down 20% of supply which was, uh, was coal orientated uh, and to move to uh, environmentally um, a more green uh, uh, policy framework through uh, wind uh, and solar. But these are more expensive but not only that they are intermittent. So you have to have a base load. So we have made ourselves increasingly dependent on intermittent supply and also highly volatile foreign uh, uh, gas. Uh, and a, a, a more sustainable policy actually would be to have a diversity of supply uh, and that would include nuclear, it would include coal, it would absolutely include uh, 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 solar uh, and wind as part of the mix. But by, by focusing solely on, on the imaginary net zero uh, credentials, A, it is, we've made our, our power very much more expensive than it is, for example, in America. 
but we're actually risking brownouts within this country. So to come back to the government's huge role in this, whether by mm. micro decisions or, or more macro ones mm. like the level mm. of public debt that they've got, the, the, is it simply economically illiterate? Is, is, is Mr Johnson simply economically illiterate? Or are, is the government singularly incompetent and has failed to spend the money properly, or is it both? In fairness to Boris Johnson, the problem goes back really much further than that. And Gordon Brown's initial decision, in my view, uh, to adopt uh, a monetary policy through the Bank of England, which was, uh, in my judgment, highly expansionary, uh, through basically ultra low interest rates and a quantitative easing programme, that programme suppresses the yield curve and has unintended consequences. It, 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 it puts up asset prices, house prices, stock market, etc. Uh, it bails out um, those with some debt, but savers and the young lose in an environment like that. Mm -hmm. um, that was the model that the, the central bank, not just the British central bank, but other central banks adopted. So COVID comes along, a much, much greater problem, uh, in my judgment, in its magnitude, or at least the way the policymakers have responded to it. Yeah. They didn't need to respond with a global uh, lockdown, lockdown, in my judgment. There was certainly uncertainty at the start of the crisis, but it soon became apparent, and we've seen mortality data coming out very recently, mm. that shows actually mortality isn't ma materially worse, actually. No. Uh, 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 and there's lots of unintended consequences of lockdown from, from mental health to educational problems mm. to missed cancer appointments. Your website mm. covers it uh, admirably. But the response the government and governments have adopted is effectively to print money. So what we basically have is the, the £370 billion that the government has spent, mm. I don't think wisely, mm. uh, but we could debate that, has been entirely funded by quantitative easing. There's been mm. no increase whatsoever in the gilt stock in the private sector. Mm. The Eurozone's done exactly the same policy. Mm. Uh, America, certainly in the mm. Biden period, similar. Uh, and I don't think it's worked. Britain has been amongst the mm. most generous in terms of its support. Uh, uh, but I think it's a misallocation and I think the government's undoubtedly tried to be kind and uh, I understand the, their motivation in doing so, but ultimately I think they're storing up enormous long-term problems. And what I've argued professionally is that the Bank of England is getting on a treadmill it can't get off because mm. it, if you start to raise materially, and, and, and it's possible mm. that rates will rise very slightly, mm. uh, but I think it'll be a tokenistic rise. If you start to raise interest rates, you'll crash the economy. And the mm. one bet that you can be sure of from central banks and government policy response mm. is, is short-term decision-making to try and kick the can down the road and reflate the economy. So we've reached a never-never land of, I think, delusional public spending. And remember, the state is now over 50% of the yeah. entire economy. It's a lot less in London, but when you mm. get to the, the North East or Scotland mm. or Northern Ireland mm. or Wales, it's, it's, it's about 60% of the economy. Yeah. And I don't think that's healthy in a, in a free society or, or in, indeed sustainable, actually. Mm. But that's the, uh, and unlike the Cameron Osborne years, where there was at least an attempt to control expenditure, we're now met with a situation uh, where money is being thrown without uh, at, at the NHS and, and, and education and other, other public services. So I, I think the fiscal deficit, that's the amount of money the government uh, uh, borrows over and above what it raises in taxes mm -hmm. is a lot more of a structural problem than the Bank of England argues. So I, I, I've argued that we're, uh, last year um, the government had to borrow 330 billion, mm. albeit it didn't because they QE'd it. Mm. This year it's going to be over 200 billion. I think that deficit's going to be embedded at close to 200 billion in, in, in the medium term. Mm. I don't think that's sustainable. What I think they will do is I, I think that they will continue to, 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 to basically QE, print, print, print money. And I think there's a medium term inflationary risk as uh, a result of that. Now, there's a big debate in the economics profession about, um, uh, about the, the risk of inflation. I, I've been in the camp that there's a material risk. Um, I do accept that, uh, that technology is deflationary, the internet is deflationary. Um, global free markets are quite uh, deflationary. But you weigh that against the, the monetary response in America, in the Eurozone, and in the UK, and in China, actually, uh, and Japan. And you, there has been a, a, an enormous expansion in central bank balance sheets. Mm. 
And this time it's gone directly into the economy via furlough, bounce back loans and public spending. And coupled with supply shortages as a result which are of locking down an economy for uh, a year or, or longer, you're starting to see bottlenecks and prices rising quite rapidly. So we, we see that, but the reality on the street out there, when, when will this in a way sufficient sound, I don't mean I want it to affect everyone badly, but when is this really going to be felt? Let's put it this way. I think there are enormous imbalances, but I don't want to be a Jeremiah today. That does mm. not mean to say that the wall, uh, everything is going to go completely mm. wrong. Um, so if, you, if, if government spends rapidly, that is in the short term pro-growth. That's a sort of classic mm. Keynesian response. I think in the long term, it's un largely unproductive and actually uh, in the long term harms the, mm. the growth potential of the economy. But in the very short term, I have argued that the economy will bounce back quite strongly. That doesn't right. mean to say I think all is well, far from it. Uh, and, uh, and that bounce back is coming from shortages, meaning that, uh, um, that uh, prices are rising, wages are rising. It's coming from public expenditure and it's coming from monetary policy where interest rates are 0.1%. Mm. But this is not a productive uh, uh, boom. This is... It's not sound they, economics. They, 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 it's not sound economics. This is a, a, a pop-up, puffed-up boom based on an unsustainable uh, 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 fiscal and monetary mm. policy, in my judgment. So I don't want your, your uh, listeners getting the impression I think everything is going to collapse tomorrow. I don't think that, mm. actually. I think in the short term, uh, there may be an element of some recovery. But that belies structural and fundamental problems. And as a country, we need to ask ourselves, do we really want to live in, in a country where um, the state is over half of GDP, where there's micro-regulation in almost every sphere. So it's not just the state is the biggest it's been outside wartime, actually. Um, it, it is the micro-regulation in the financial industry, mm. in the employment industry, the quotas that are, mm. are increasingly uh, companies are, are forced to develop, the, the micromanagement of the energy industry. There's mm. hardly an industry that the man from the ministry doesn't think he yeah. can control. And I, I don't think that's compatible with a free society. Not only that, we have a chancellor who's just put up taxes uh, equivalent to 1.6% of GDP. Mm. He's put up corporation tax, he's introduced a, a further dividend tax, uh, he's put up national insurance, mm. he's frozen uh, all sorts of uh, uh, allowances. That 1.6 is the highest increase in tax relative to uh, GDP of any chancellor, mm. including Healy in the 1970s. Mm. That's quite, quite an honour. Uh, not. Uh, 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 and so, and taxes are now at the highest level yeah. since the, the, the 1950s in this country. I, I, you know, I think we need a radical rethink here. Uh, and I think we need to grow the cake uh, through a, a broadly free society and a vibrant private sector and gradually reducing taxes, uh, which will actually feed on themselves. Um, uh, uh, rather than short-term political mm. fixes of pumping money into the NHS, into, a, in, mm. frankly, a black hole, which has got fairly poor outcomes uh, or, mm. on average, uh, a failing education system, and, and further uh, tax rises, which ultimately will yeah. uh, undo our, our productivity. So I think the government's approach is exactly the wrong way around, mm. uh, but... That doesn't mean to say everything is going to go wrong tomorrow, but no. they are storing up big problems uh, in the medium term. Um, and one thing you didn't mention on top of this, another micro, not such a mm. micro intervention, is, is Boris Johnson's whole levelling up policy yeah. and, and saying uh, uh, um, raising minimum wage. I mean, <clears throat> you know, you say everything depends on the private sector, but if that could in itself could crowd the private sector out. People, people can't probably afford to put the wages up if they're running a business after lockdown and keeping it going? The debate in the mainstream media, I think, is delusionary. And yeah. it, uh, so there, if one listens to Radio 4, which I generally mm. don't, but if one does, uh, various left-wing think tanks are wheeled mm. out and they present a, a, a Dickensian picture mm. of, of poverty and a grossly unfair society. So let's mm. nail th these charges on the head. Firstly, um, Britain is an averagely equal society mm. you know, on a global context. Looking mm. at the Gini coefficient 
uh, we are not an outlier in mm. any sense. So th this is already a society where there's very, very substantial mm. uh, transfer uh, payments. Uh, secondly, um, the minimum wage in Britain is the highest of any European country with the exception of Luxembourg. And Luxembourg, frankly, is a tiny country and isn't a comparative. If we have, it's a higher minimum wage uh, than France, Germany, Holland. Um, it, the minimum wage is about 50% higher than the United States of America. And it's three or four times higher than the minimum wages uh, of many Eastern European mm. countries. So already Britain sets a minimum wage at a very, very generous level. Um, already Britain has transfer payments uh, which uh, are of over £200 billion mm. a year, and that was before, before furlough. These are enormous numbers. Uh, so, you know, Britain is, uh, uh, is, a, is a leader, uh, if, if that's the way you want to, to look at it, in, in, in terms of uh, alleviating uh, uh, difficulty. Um, but that isn't the nature of the debate. And there is a, there is a balance between mm. actually encouraging people uh, uh, to, to work hard and uh, be enterprising and, uh, and productive members of society. And I think that balance, uh, um, the debate has become delusional, yeah. actually. And is it delusional within the Treasury too? If you were to walk in the Treasury tomorrow, say somebody, he, he, he sort of had a, a revelation overnight, Boris Johnson said, we have to bring Ewan Stewart <laughs> in to advise the Chancellor of the Exchequer, or to be the Chancellor of the <laughs> Exchequer. I mean, would they think you were crazy? Yeah, they probably would, uh, uh, to be honest. I mean, I think there's a Keynesian bias mm. uh, within uh, the, the Treasury. Uh, I, I, they, they seem to look at, uh, they, uh, they put a lot of faith in so-called output gaps, which mm. I think is a very, in a, in a highly uh, technology economy, is a highly questionable um, uh, uh, methodology. Um, I think that uh, the far too much time is, is, is taken on, on short-term fixes. And uh, actually, I think we need to reappraise the way um, government interacts with the economy. And I, I think a good chancellor uh, would look at the tried and tested methods that worked actually for West Germany after it was ruined after the Second World War. Uh, they worked for Hong Kong. Um, they, they, they worked actually for Britain in the 80s and they worked for America in the 80s. And actually, it isn't rocket science, it's the Laffer curve. It is if you sensibly cut taxes and simplify taxes, you'll start to grow the economy. Uh, we are taking the opposite uh, approach. Britain should be doing really well. We have strategic advantage in a number of high growth industries. London is the global capital, perhaps of New York of the world. Um, the city is one of the two top financial centres. Our artistic and cultural base is probably as strong as any in the world. Even after lockdown? Mm. That's coming back. I don't know if you spotted in London, but uh, the theatres are pretty it's full pretty, yes. and, uh, and, and that's great. I mean, it's a massive mm. strategic advantage and uh, there's no European country. Mm. And that's not to knock France mm. or Germany or, or Italy, or magnificent cultures. Um, but London has uh, a West End. It has uh, a, an artistic, a sporting scene that I think is almost mm. uh, unique in the world. And there's a huge advantage. Elite education, the UK is, is, is a global market leader. You know, there are more unicorn. Unicorn is a billion pound technology companies floated in London than all of Europe combined. Mm. So yes, we're not the Silicon Valley, mm. but London actually is a, is a significant tech hub. These are all strategically growing industries. We need to raise our sights. Uh, Britain uh, was creating a lot of jobs before uh, the lockdown. The, our performance over the lockdown has been shambolic. Uh, the government has micromanaged, it is spent vastly and unproductively, and I think is mm. you know, potentially indebting future generations yeah. and distorting, actually, uh, the economy. But actually, the good news is things can regenerate very, yeah. very quickly. And we still have enough strategic advantage in growth industries that if we could get a government that uh, instead of throwing money at problems unproductively and actually damaging uh, the productive element, if they looked at it from the other end of the lens, mm. uh, deregulated sensibly. No one is saying no regulation, we're just sensible deregulation. I mean, my industry, the city, if you take MIFID too, I won't go into the details, mm. but the, you know, it, it, there are costs to this. Um, about 15% of the cost base of a fund management company is compliance. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. That is passed on in pensions. Yes. There are lots of things that can be done sensibly where there's still very high mm -hmm. protection. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so we need to, to, to cut tax, we need oh. to reduce regulation very sensibly, and we need to trust the people. Yeah. And I, the way I would look at it is, are we a free society yeah. any longer? I think that's becoming questionable when yeah. the state is so embedded. Coming back on that, I mean, you're sort of like trying to introduce a note of optimism of what's yeah. possible. Um, there are two things here that I want to touch on before we finish. One is when you talked about in one of the papers I saw how lockdown had uprooted the economy. You said that there, it had uprooted in such a way as to make win in the most desperate way to make winners and losers yeah. and of those losers the younger generation the COVID generation is one I wonder if you could expand on that the last decade has created arbitrary winners and losers and mm. the, the, the biggest factor behind that has been monetary policy mm -hmm. so uh, and by that I mean basically having interest rates close to zero mm. so th those that have uh, gained are, are generally those with assets because mm. house prices have gone up, the stock market's done mm. quite well. Mm. Uh, 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 and those with debt, because mm. the level of interest is below the rate of inflation and therefore the debt's being eroded. Those that have lost are often pensioners savers. Uh, uh, and savers. With people with cash savings have done very badly. Uh, and the young have found it very difficult. Um, uh, and they've done find it very difficult because um, it's harder for them to get on the housing ladder. Uh, and uh, house prices relative to graduate salaries mm. or, or any salary actually are, have become un unsustainable. Mm. And that creates a political problem. And I think we, uh, those of us who take a, a sort of fairly free market, uh, classical liberal mm. view, uh, need to be a little concerned because I think some of the young are drawing the wrong sort of Corbyn Easter conclusions becoming, mm. uh, uh, and actually, it, it, uh, I think um, we need to do a lot of work to explain to them actually that we, we're living in a highly managed society mm. now, actually a very socialist society in many senses, badged under a conservative mm. party. Uh, and that is what really has harmed them. So you talk <laughs> about our elite um, sort of education, but I'm not sure I see much elite education around these days, but maybe there is well, lurking behind the news headlines. Well, that's a debate for another day, but I'll, I'll give you what is absolutely true, yeah. what, whatever, uh, and I think we probably share very similar views mm. on, on the work world, um, but uh, our top uh, private schools and our top universities are sought after yeah. Uh, 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 by people around the world, rightly or wrongly, you know, and that's what I mean by it being yeah. an export market. Mm -hmm. And certainly in terms of scientific discovery and innovation, mm -hmm. the UK continues mm -hmm. to do very, very well and they're, they're highly regarded. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with you mm -hmm. uh, on some of the cultural mm -hmm. uh, aspects of, of our universities, mm -hmm. which I think has become a, um, slightly strange, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but... Uh, so we've created an environment of significant winners and losers, and, uh, and that's unhealthy mm. in a democracy. Uh, success should be based on hard work and, uh, yeah, uh, mm. uh, and all the sort of good things that, that, mm. that, that go with that. What about the under-30s? What about what they call the COVID generation? Um, why has this hit them so badly? How have their lives been disrupted? I think terribly. You know, from a medical perspective, the risk to people under 30 is, is negligible, absolutely negligible, and they've paid an enormous price. Um, th those at, at school often have had almost no school for, 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 a, for a year, and it's critical to have interaction. You know, a lot of school is role play and meeting people and discussing, and, uh, and uh, some schools have done very well, of course they have, but, but many, many have not. And then you get to, to the universities, you know what, I loved Freshers Week at university. <laughs> I'm thinking, I judge by your smile, you did too. Uh, to be locked up in a university uh, uh, virtually um, is a disgrace. And then we have the exams, prizes for all, prizes for no one. You know, education is, uh, life is competitive, whether we like it or, or not. And the people who get to the top of industry have often worked incredibly hard over a long period of time. You don't get there by offering everyone an A. Yeah. And that's not to demean people that worked extremely hard, you know, but mm. the fact of the matter is we have to differentiate mm. and that's not happened. Mm. So I feel extremely sorry for those mm. leaving school. And then again, in the workplace, you know, you can't work virtually 
if you're a new employee, you've got to understand the culture of the firm, you've got to meet people, see how it works. Mm. And they've been denied that opportunity. Mm. And then on top of that, travel's a big part mm. of all of our lives, but a lot of young people like mm. to go on gap years and all the rest of it closed down. Mm. So I, I think the young have been hit unbelievably hard by this, and I think that is a tragedy. Has lockdown and the effect of these sort of wrong policies, as you've um, described them, has it created what I would call um, an ugly face of capitalism? I think it's a crony capitalism, actually. A crony uh, yeah, capitalism. Yeah. So uh, I think what you've now got is government being a very substantial agent uh, um, and uh, it's become oligopolistic in certain places. Uh, I th um, uh, but... Uh, we shouldn't forget these things can regenerate mm. quite quickly. And it's signals from government that would change that. I'm, I have to say in the short term, I'm not hopeful we're going to get these signals. Mm. But um, we shouldn't forget, uh, take Eastern Europe, absolutely mm. ruined after 50 or 60 years mm. of uh, a very repressive mm. uh, statist mm. uh, regime. Um, recovery mm. is ongoing, but they, they, they have actually recovered, uh, yeah. you know, quite quite quickly. We still have it within ourselves um, if we have that self-confidence uh, and we certainly have on a global basis mm. strong strategic assets um, which uh, mm. can regenerate quite quite quickly but I don't see in this government no. uh, very many if any actually significant uh, um, figures in the cabinet that are prepared to to argue for the, the sort of remedies that we, we had in the 1980s yeah. uh, which may have been uh, the left might not have liked that brand, but it, it was the bedrock of our prosperity mm. for the next 30 or 40 years. And gave us our liberty. I would say so. So yeah. one final question. You say that debate isn't taking place in the government. There are no signs of it. How much of that debate exists in the media? And what culpability does the media have for effectively censoring, um, for, for encouraging what you might call a victim narrative and censoring um, straightforward... Um, economics, really, as, well, you've, as, as you've set them out. There are, are a number of people that would see the world in a similar-ish way to yes. them, not, not unique by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, what is extremely unfortunate is certainly in the TV media that, uh, um, or, or the principal channels, mm. that uh, the go-to um, uh, think tanks and commentators are almost all from from, from the left. Mm. They're almost all from the, the perspective that the state can organise things well, that there's poverty, that, uh, 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 that more should be done mm. from, a, uh, from a government uh, micromanagement perspective. And there's, there's no balance, mm. there, or very, very little balance. Um, in the blogosphere, and uh, um, certainly when I go around and see my city clients, I think they're pretty, uh, pretty aware of what's going on. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, they undoubtedly see the scale of the imbalances that there, mm. there are. Uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, I think um, it's not quite as bleak uh, as it sounds, but uh, we need to, to ch try and change that narrative uh, and, and, and make the case. And it isn't uh, novel, it's not even radical particularly. You know, what is radical is what we've got now, actually. The, you know, at no point in Britain's history outside World War I and World War II have we had a state as dominant uh, as, it, as, it, as it is at the moment. Mm. Uh, you know, at no point have um, uh, we had a, a, a political debate mm. where we have um, a Conservative Party that seems to mm. be well left of Blair and Brown, mm. actually, and a Labour Party now looking at wealth taxes and, mm. you know, uh, and, and yet more regulation. And I think it's absolutely critical that um, those uh, who view the world differently, um, who believe in personal freedom, uh, um, start to articulate a, a plan to grow the cake rather than redistribute the cake and, sh and shrink it. And part of that is tax, but part of it is getting back to a sustainable monetary policy. Mm -hmm. and, and that means in time uh, um, ending quantitative easing, because all that does is it encourages government to spend more mm -hmm. on the never never. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that is ultimately inflationary. Mm -hmm. And we need to get back to an interest rate policy mm -hmm. where 
interest rates are somewhat higher, mm -hmm. savers are rewarded, but actually uh, it, 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 it makes asset prices mm -hmm. more affordable uh, um, uh, 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 to the young and, mm -hmm. and, and the old. But that can only be done gradually. I, I don't, mm -hmm. wouldn't advocate a big bang because you, you, you'd mm -hmm. risk, risk a crash if you did that. But we, there is a, a lack of articulation and there's a kicking of the can mm -hmm. down the road and um, while we probably are going to have a bit of a recovery, I think there'll be an inflationary recovery, by mm. the way, and that in itself further exacerbates winners and, and losers. This isn't a healthy recovery. This is a, a recovery where productivity is being damaged. Um, and there are risks down the road. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 absolutely. And, and, uh, and I think we're also at a stage where as inflation takes hold, monetary policy becomes harder and harder for yes. the central bank to justify, actually. And it, it, the tools they have to moderate inflation um, uh, are limited because mm. if they're not going to raise interest rates, they've, they've got to hope this is a short-term phenomenon. Yeah. I don't think it is, actually. To get this mm. debate going properly in the media and government, what's your challenge to them? How can... Because at the moment, we're sitting here talking about this, but this isn't the mainstream narrative at all anywhere. We need to find political leaders who uh, broadly buy into our philosophy, you know. And, and mm. in the Conservative Party, there are some. Steve Baker is someone mm. who, who gets it. Mm. Uh, 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 there are a number of other, John Redwood, mm. uh, uh, um, um, uh, Owen Patterson, there's, there's a good number, there's, there's, there's a good exist. number of people. Uh, maybe Liz Truss does, I don't know. I, 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 time will tell, mm. but maybe she does. Um, the, Richard Tice, you mm. know, I think gets it. Uh, 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 and, and there are a lot of economists, like Liam Halligan, who writes The mm. Telegraph and is on GB News. He's mm. a fairly, I don't want to put words in his mouth, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think he sees the world in a not dissimilar yeah. way. Um, there's, you know, uh, he, he's more Keynesian than I am, Roger Bootle, Actually, very sensible guy. You know, mm. uh, uh, you know. There's Tim Condon. There's there's Minford. There's a, a vast number, mm. actually, of of people that view the world uh, in a in a not dissimilar light. And I think we need to. I wouldn't say get together is the is maybe the wrong way of putting it, but we just need to keep on making the case because mm. I think more people will see how delusionary these policies mm. are actually, and how extreme they are, and they're also untested. There's no precedent in our in in history, actually, uh, where central banks have printed in modern history have printed to the extent they're they're printing, and I don't think that can can ultimately end well.